Hey everyone, I'm Maury and I am so pumped that you decided to tune in with us today. We have an amazing time of worship and message prepared for you as our pastor Drew speaks on forgiveness. So before we get to that, turn up your volume and join in and worship with us. Oh, it's so good to see you here, Canyon Ridge. I hope you came excited and expected for all the good things God is going to do in this place. Come on, let's sing. Our blood is one. Children of generations of every nation of kingdom come. So don't let your heart trouble. Hold your head up. I don't fear no evil. Fear your eyes on this one truth. God is madly in love with you. So take courage, hold on, be strong. Remember where our help comes for us. Jesus, 
nothing like the power of our God. It's so encouraging to be reminded of that this morning, to know that no matter what we have faced, no matter what we will face, or whatever battle we might be in right now, it belongs to our God and victory is in Him, amen? I was thinking this morning how as followers of Jesus, we don't fight battles or even face battles in conventional ways. Instead, like scripture invites us to, we put on the armor of God. We immerse ourselves in his word. We find good support from good friends and we pray consistently. And that is what this song says, when I fight, I will fight on my knees. That is pointing to a posture of prayer. One that can be found all throughout scripture. We even see Jesus himself on his knees in the garden, praying to his father. And with hands lifted high, I surrender to you, God. In our worship times, when we come together, you see people lift their hands. That's an acknowledgement of who God is, that he is God, that we are not, that his ways are higher than ours, that his thoughts are higher than ours. And in many ways, raising our hands is just surrendering to that, saying, you are God, you are worthy of my praise, of my worship. To you, I will lay down every fear, every worry at your feet. This morning, I wanna invite you just to call to mind whatever battle you might be in right now, whether it feels small or big, anything that feels out of your control, just call it to mind. Hold it in the presence of our God this morning. Invite him to come close today. He is with you and he is for you. Maybe this morning you're realizing I've tried to fight this all alone. And I just know God is saying today, you don't have to fight this on your own. I will fight this battle for you. I am standing beside you. I go before you. I'll come after you. Release it and surrender it to me today. Maybe he wants to invite you into deeper prayer. You can begin that right now. Just say, God, come close. Let me know you're here, fight this for me. I surrender my fears to you, my worries over this. I know that you are God and I am not. Father, we just invite your spirit to move in this place. And to every person at home that is watching online, God, come and move by your power, by your strength. May we surrender to you in a new way today, God. We try to hold on to so much with closed fists. Today we just wanna open our hands and give it to you, Lord. We will fight through prayer and through trust, Lord, knowing that you are God and you are good and you are here and you are with us. Church, let's lift up these words again in this song. When we fight, just acknowledging we're gonna take a step closer to you today, God, when we fight on our knees. And when I fight, fight on my knees, with my hands lifted high, oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay, I hold just release it all. I'll sing through the night, oh God, the battle belongs. Come on, church, sing it out again. Cause when I fight, I fight on my knees. With my hands lifted high, oh God, the battle belongs. We surrender to you, and every fear I lay at your feet. I'll sing through the night, oh God, the battle belongs to Just declare that again to him, oh God. And oh God, the battle belongs to you. surrounding me let it break at your name still call the 
seed is still, the rage of meat is still every wave at your name. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, you silence fear. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, breathe, call these bones to live. And call these lungs to see once again. I will praise Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus. You silence fear. Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus. Keep singing out his name. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, you silence fear. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Thank you that you are the light in our darkness. God, we just invite you here today because when you are with us, darkness cannot exist. Anxiety, fear, worry, all those things cannot exist, God. So we invite you here, God, your presence in this room. Lord, thank you for your grace. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for your mercies that are new every morning, Lord. We just surrender everything to you. We trust you with our future. We trust you with today. God, you are so good, so faithful.
We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Let me have a seat. Hey, Canyon Ridge, we are celebrating all the baptisms that we had this weekend here at our church. I decided today that I'm going to be rebaptized to kind of let go of my past and start fresh. To be closer to God and start out fresh and new and just start a full spiritual journey with Him just immerse myself in him and let him take me where I'm gonna go. So she has been wanting to do it for a while and this is actually the first time we've been back to church in a really long time. So to have my daughter take the next step with Jesus, so thank you. Uh, here at Canyon Ridge, we just celebrate anytime God gets God's way. Anytime someone says yes in Jesus' direction in any way, shape, or form, anytime things go the way God wants, we just celebrate and we're excited, and that's never more true than a baptism. Uh, you know, there's moments in life that need like a marker in time. There needs to be a thing that this is the moment, right? Kind of like graduation. We've got some graduates right now, some people excited to leave high school behind and say, I've finished and I'm moving on, or maybe it's middle school or those epic kindergarten graduations that people go through, right? A moment in time, right? A moment in time, the point that marks a shift from one season into another. Uh, some of these kind of celebrations also seal a kind of commitment. Uh, a lot of times I get to go hang with guys at, at Nellis or, or Creech and see a change of command or a, a promotion ceremony and saying there was a season before and there's a season after and it's good and right to mark that moment in time. Wedding days are like this, right? A season where our relationship was like this but a commitment to move from this point forward in a whole different way with no intention for that to ever change. Uh, and essentially baptism is that kind of picture in our life with Jesus. But there was a time where we kind of came to know him, where we encountered him, where we saw and experienced enough of him that made us think, you know what, I never, ever, ever want a moment in my life without him. And what the Bible has to say about that moment is that we mark that moment in a thing called baptism, this awesome picture of a burial of our old life and a resurrection of a new kind of life, celebrating and identifying with what Jesus did for us, entering the grave, giving his life on our behalf and raising to a new kind of life, showing us that the same thing is available to us. It helps us mark that kind of story. So I just wanna say, for any of you who are finding your way in Jesus' direction, and you're not sure what the next step is, if you have never taken that moment to say, yes, from this point forward, I'm with Jesus, I wanna encourage you to do that. You can go to canyonridge.org slash baptism. You can ask the person next to you. Uh, you can grab any of our folks uh, along the way who are volunteering. We'll help you take the next step. It's the right thing. Can we just celebrate one more time, folks saying yes in his, his direction? It's awesome. It becomes this marker and like this, uh, this story that all of us as followers of Jesus share that there was a before and then Jesus and an after. In fact, if you're sitting next to someone who claims to be a follower of Jesus, you should ask them today, what's your before and after story? What was before like? For me, listen, uh, there's just this natural competitive wiring in me that early on in life, it was all about me. It was all about who I could beat, how I could win, how much I could achieve, how far I could go. And it didn't take long for like the, the self-consciousness, the self-awareness, the self-seeking to just become really exhausting. Uh, and then Jesus. And what I'm finding as he invites me to live his way is that, man, it is so, there's so much more joy in partnering with people than competing against them that we can achieve together and get shoulder to shoulder instead of face to face, and it's just so much better. This natural wiring that God put in me, this energy and passion to run hard after stuff, is finding a way, 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 way fuller expression as I lift others up alongside me rather than pushing them down to get ahead. And I spend a lot more time these days thinking about the accomplishments that we get to make together rather than those I'll attain on my own. Do you have a transformation story? A before and an after. Every follower of Jesus does, and I just want you to know this is the kind of story, you'll have your version, it'll be different than mine just because of the way you, God's made you and God's made me, but you will have that kind of story when you say yes to Jesus. In fact, there's places across the Bible where this 
kind of story is captured, I wanna share one of them with you from Ephesians chapter two. If you have your Bible or you have a, a Bible app on your phone, I just encourage you to read along with me, bookmark this, text it to yourself. Ephesians chapter two. It starts like, this. it doesn't start super welcoming. So if you're not a follower of Jesus, look out. It's coming in, coming in hot, okay? Verse one, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. And some of you are like, okay. Listen, I've had enough judgment in my life. I did not show up here for that today. There's no judgment in this because all of us find ourselves in this place. Every single one of us has done things to harm ourselves and harm people around us. Every single one of us has found things in our life that as hard as we try, we don't get, things don't go the way that we want. We cause harm to ourselves and others around us. The Bible calls that sin. And it's contrary to what God wants us and that's why it's called disobedience. And the truth is, listen, I, our before star, stories sound like that. It sounds like things breaking everywhere. That's what it feels like. But then when Jesus shows up, a whole different story begins. Verse four says this, but. God is so rich in mercy. There's no scarcity with him, there's no limit, it's not gonna run out, he is so rich in mercy and he loved us. Love, like seeking the good of another at great cost to yourself. He loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Jesus from the dead. And it's only, it's only, it's only by God's grace. It's the only way. It's only his unmerited gift to us, grace, that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. We become part of his family. So God can point to us, this is so cool, what he does in us, not because we earned it, not because we did it, but because he did it in us and for us, he can now point to us in future generations as examples of his incredible wealth, of his grace and his kindness toward us as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus, that this grace and mercy that he shows in our lives is what points to how awesome he is. Verse eight, God saved you by his grace when he believed. And you can't take credit for this. No one can. It is a gift from God. Right? This is our story, followers of Jesus. Salvation is not a reward. You need to catch this, especially if you're not running in Jesus' direction yet. Don't get confused. It is not a reward for good things we have done. Any good that we do is in response to the gift we've already received. It's not a reward for the good things we've done. So there's no one who can boast. We all come humbly broken and invite him to rebuild and remake. This is the before and the after. It's when he gets involved that things change. For we are God's masterpiece artwork so that he has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things that he has planned for us long ago no longer stuck in the broken, frustrating, debilitating, deteriorating things that we lived in before, but instead created anew in his grace to do great things. Christians, this is our story, right? Can I get a head nod? That this is the life we are finding our way into. If you've been wondering what life with Jesus is like, it's not just a set of practices, it's not a list of rules to obey, it's not something to be earned, it is a relationship we find our way into, and God remakes us. This is our story, that Jesus meets us not with condemnation and judgment, but instead with mercy. Mercy is this, is a rescuing us from what we really deserve, right? When you know you deserve something, you're like, please don't hold me accountable. When the red and blue lights are flashing behind you and you know before they get there why you pulled over, what you want is mercy. Please don't get me what I actually deserve, right? This is how Jesus shows up in our life. And on top of that, he doesn't just show up with mercy. It's not just a written warning. He shows up with grace, giving us more than we could ever deserve. This is our story. And as far as we're gonna go today in some challenging stuff, please don't lose sight of this gospel good news story that he writes in our lives. The moment we lose sight of that story, things go wonky, all right? So hold on to this. In light of that story, our response is to live Jesus' way. 
He loved us so much that we can trust what he says. And so around here, we're about joining him. We're not just about knowing about him or agreeing with him. We are about doing what he invites us to do. Even when we're not sure how it's gonna go, even when it's costly, even when it's uncomfortable, even when it's contrary to what everything around us, says us to, tells us to do, we do this. And so one guy was trying to capture this, the same guy who wrote what we just read. His name is Paul. He's a follower of Jesus. Just a couple chapters later in Ephesians chapter four, he says this. Let the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, God himself moves in when we say yes to Jesus. Let the Spirit renew. Instead of the old life where stuff's breaking down and getting old by the second, let him renew our thoughts and our attitudes. And so he says this. Let's just do this. Let's just make a checklist. Are you all ready? Let's all get rid of bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. All right, so everybody make a checklist and just check one of those off. We're good. Everybody good? Man, if only it was that easy, right? Holy cow. Think about the last 18 months. I mean, I know many of you could go way past that. Some of you don't even need to go that far. But is anybody, can anyone just call to mind anything? Maybe just like really reach and stretch because it might be hard. Can anybody think of anything to be bitter about lately? Any times where you find emotion just kind of welling up? Maybe you wouldn't call it rage, but you, you like respond to something that's like a two-level issue, but you come with like eight-level intensity, right? I'm watching the elbows fly, right? How many of you just looked at the person next to you? I saw you. I don't know if that was a confession or a condemnation. Either way, a lot of you found someone looking back. I saw you. Can anyone think of anything in the last 18 months that makes you angry? There are things to be angry about. And in our anger, anyone, maybe I'm just the only one, but has anyone in their anger, their words, their facial expressions, their posture could accurately be described as harsh? I know I'm so in your business right now. It's all right, because everybody's with us. We're all in the same boat. There's no, there's no judgment for you. We're just, we're just standing together, and confession just means saying in agreement what's true. We know these things are true. The opportunity for these things in our lives are right at hand, and maybe now more than ever. Right, and it's too easy. It's, too e it's just way too easy to paint everything in a negative light, even people who aren't around us taking what is legitimate about the way they may have disagreed with us, harmed us, hurt us, judged us, overlooked us, diminished us along the way, and suddenly when we're describing that to someone else, not only do we describe our hurt accurately to someone else, we add just a little bit to make sure they know that person's in the wrong. We laugh because it's untrue and uncomfortable. But it's his, isn't it? But listen, what we're invited to is to get rid of all of that, why? Because it's exhausting, isn't it? We're doing this whole series called Rest, and the reason is there are things that weigh us down. Last week we stepped into this really well, talking about rhythms of rest and God's invitation to the Sabbath and to rhythms of just remaining and letting him be him and us just being us and remembering that we don't actually carry the whole world and our work actually doesn't define us. There's so many good things about rest, but there's also some things along the way that we have picked up that are exhausting. Like walking through mud, little by little, it accumulates around your shoes until your feet are so heavy you can't walk the way you wish you could walk. We pick up anger, we pick up bitterness, harsh words, go sideways, slander from others to us and from us to others, cause division. All of a sudden, we're exhausted trying to avoid each other, right? Listen, this invitation that God has for us, it's, it makes sense. No one has this vision for their life, right? No one sits down, like your third grader doesn't bring home this picture of their life, right? I hope to live with a constant low-grade bitterness that leaks out into anger and harsh words keeping me distant from others around me. No one has that vision for their life, but how many people are living it? If we actually back up and just look across what we've experienced, what we've gone through, right, from things like masks to things like politics to legitimate concerns around race and all kinds of other things that have caused 
absolute strife in the last 18 months and real loss along the way. We've picked some things up. The question is, what do we do with it? Hurt and wounding is not foreign to anyone here. The availability of bitterness, anger, or anything along the way is not unheard of. It is common. But what do we do? What's the way through? Well, I wanna remind you where we started this whole series. In Matthew chapter 11, Jesus says this. You wanna know what to do? I'll tell you what to do. Come to me. He says, come to me. He doesn't say, go to Facebook. He doesn't say, go to your posse. He says, come to me. He doesn't say, gather up pitchforks and torches and go get them. He says, no, 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 listen, listen, listen. Here's where you start. Come to me, come to me, come to me, come to me. All of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and let me just be honest, the wounding, anger, bitterness, and things that we accumulate along the way, they're not illegitimate. It's not like it didn't happen. It's not like it didn't hurt. It's not like it's not heavy. No one's saying that. There's a legitimate weariness in us. But he says, listen, here's what I'll do. If you'll come to me, I'll give you rest. He says, take my yoke, which is a, a set of teaching, a way of life. Take my yoke upon you. Uh, let me teach you, he says. Let me teach you. Don't look everywhere else. Look to me. Let me teach you because I'm humble and gentle at heart. Remember that whole story we read at the beginning of how he rescued us, his mercy, his grace. We can trust him. He's got good in mind for us. He says, let me teach you because I'm humble and gentle at heart. And you will, you will, not you might, but you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy. And the burden I give you is light. When we think about the ways that Jesus wants to bring rest into our life, this habit of rest that we talked about last week really matters, but so does setting down some of the hurts and wounding that we've picked up along the way, the offenses that we keep circling in our mind. Listen, anger, bitterness, and the results of slander and gossip are exhausting. Avoiding all the people who have hurt you, cutting them out and canceling creates a very narrow track for your life and a constant management of staying at a comfortable distance from them. It takes energy. The exhausting arguments with them in your head, which I love those kind because I always win those, you know what I'm saying? But aren't you tired of that? Like wouldn't that mental energy just be way better served, offered to your friends to your family, to the calling God has placed on your life, rather than leaking out everywhere in the directions of our hurts and offenses. Listen, in the midst of this, one of the ways that Jesus invites us to deal with our woundings and our hurts that we've picked up, even our griefs along the way, Jesus says this. Here's what you do, forgive. And he can say that with integrity, because you remember the story we started with, right? He said, come to me, I will teach you, I will show you, and he says the way is forgive. In fact, Paul, the guy who we've been reading so far in Ephesians chapter four would say it this way, just after put away all anger, bitterness, and all those things, he says, instead, instead be kind to each other. Imagine that, just be kind to each other. Be tenderhearted instead of hardhearted. Instead of building walls and firming up and clenching and flexing so you're ready, he says, no, 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 be tenderhearted, forgiving one another not because they deserve it, not because that's what they've done for you. He says, no, 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 your model is not what's around you, your model is me, Jesus says, forgive. Just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Listen, followers of Jesus especially, our story, our identity is a forgiven people. And so it's not a surprise that, that the invitation from Jesus with us with our hurts is to forgive. Now many of you who've been around churches are like, well of course it is. But that journey's not simple, is it? Some of you, it's too easy and too quick to call to mind that deepest hurt that I don't even understand in the next 15 or 20 minutes of conversation is not gonna fix. But you know the tiredness from carrying it. And in the last 18 months, the little ticky tack stuff along the way, not the huge things. I was just talking to a friend right over here just a little bit ago. There are heavy burdens and deep hurts and 
epic betrayals that sometimes you're even convinced that they're your fault and so you carry it double heavy. Those are heavy and yes, God's invitation still is to forgive. That's a different kind of journey. But there's also these little things along the way of rude things people have said, inconsiderations, dismissals, and in the tension of the last 18 months, little by little, we just pick up this weight and things get heavy and we get tired. And the question is, what do we do with all of those? What we're not gonna do today is we're not gonna wrestle our way through reconciliation. When someone hurts us, how do we come back together? We actually address that really widely in a four-week series in the fall called Eye to Eye. I encourage you to look back to that if that's where you're at in the process. But we're actually gonna back up before that. What is the rest for our souls? What is the work God wants to do in us to move us in the direction of setting these weights down? How do we actually step into forgiveness so the weight we carry is less, that we can step into those more helpfully, a little bit more lightly? So I wanna encourage you, at great risk and as much boldness as you can muster, what offense do you wanna hold in front of you as we talk about this? I would not encourage you to go to the most deep, dark, hardest place. I also wouldn't just, uh, well, maybe it's the comment somebody made on the way in. Maybe it's just a little bit farther, but give this real traction in your life by calling to mind an, infant, an offense. And what we're gonna do is wrestle with the internal, okay? I'm gonna do this a little bit through the way of, of a journey I've been on. In the midst of last summer, I don't know if you remember last summer, it feels like a decade ago, but last summer we were in, um, we were in a season where the political season was ahead. The pandemic and the, all the distancing was two or three months old. We thought it was a three-hour tour. We didn't know it was gonna be over a year, but we were tired of it, right? The second wave hadn't hit. It was kinda on the way down. We were semi-hopeful, and our hopes were about to be dashed along the way. Everyone was tired and frustrated. We finally made it through the school year. We step into the summer, and event after event after event raised a long-standing issue of racial tension over and over and over and over in our summer. You remember this season, right? I know we don't want to, but you do. In the middle of that, I called my buddy Cedric. Cedric is uh, he's an army ranger, but he's also a doctor of psychology. And I said, Cedric, we need more than we brought in terms of multicultural competency. Can you help me? And so he put me through kind of this battery of tests to help me figure out right where I'm at so that I could help engage helpfully with others around so that we as a church could step helpfully into all that our culture is experiencing and wandering through from all different directions. We're just trying to find our way forward. And in the midst of that, one of the things that he said to me personally, he said, Drew, if you're gonna take this journey, you need a better practice of forgiveness. And I'm like, Cedric, that's not the question I asked. <clears throat> but as I started to think about it, after all my excuses, I've taught forgiveness. I know the definition of forgiveness. I could, I could talk for two hours about forgiveness. I could talk about success of forgiveness. I know all the reasons to forgive. I know how Jesus forgave. I know all the things. But there's something different about a practice <clears throat> of forgiveness, a diligent attention to setting down things that you're tempted to pick up along the way a diligent practice of dealing with those things that keep trying to reattach and find their way back into your backpack. And as far as you push them to the bottom, we still find ourselves carrying them. And so I went to a couple of close friends. I said, help me understand this idea of a practice of forgiveness. I went to Kevin, I went to a friend of mine named Jim Branch, and he pointed me to this epic resource, and I want you to take a picture of this, I want you to buy this book. If you are on a journey to forgive, whether it's deep and dark and challenging or you just find yourself too easily captured by bitterness or whatever, let Marjorie Thompson teach you, okay? She has taught me over the recent months. I've been on this journey for a while. I love this. She says this. The Christian faith is indelibly marked by the invitation to receive and the imperative to offer forgiveness. It's both. This is not a cursory strategy to a better life. This is not just a good idea for some people. This is at the center of our faith. He, she goes on farther and says it this way uh, in this book, Forgiveness. Again, Marjorie Thompson, take your picture, you're good to go. Forgiving others is one of the key ways, is one of the key ways that makes for peace. Does anyone know a culture, a city, a neighborhood, or a home that needs a little bit more peace than we've had in the last 18 months? Forgiving is one of the key things that make for peace as Jesus will reveal and embody, this book was made to lead up to Easter, but of course his sacrifice is all about making peace. 
I love this. She says, the renewal of harmonious, spiritually healthy relationships with God and with others is the whole purpose of Jesus showing up. Think about that. A plan orchestrated from the beginning of time. At the center of it was the rebuilding of healthy relationships, and forgiveness is central to that. This is no separate idea. So as we take some steps in the next few minutes to get started, you cannot dismiss this as just a good idea. Uh, Maybe I'll try it someday. For all of us who follow Jesus, this is central to who we are. Forgiveness by Marjorie Thompson, if you missed it, is so helpful. Today, I just wanna quickly offer you four steps to get started, okay? So capture these if you want. Four steps to just begin this journey. This is what I've been learning over the last five or six months. Let me be clear, by the way, too. um, In this book, I got a list. I got a list of people who, if they showed up right here next to me, it'd be real awkward. It'd be real awkward. Because in my mind, there are things they have done to bring real hurt into my life. Do you have a list? Who would it be real weird to look up in the aisle of the grocery store and there they are? And in that moment, you're thinking, do I U-turn like real hard pretending I didn't see them? Or do I walk past on purpose? Do I kick him in the shin? (laughs) Is it just me? Or have you thought that? I got a list. And I'm working through it. And I'm not there yet. Because the last 12 to 18 months have been pretty stinking hard. As I looked at the list, though, and I was asking for help, I elicited help from Marjorie Thompson, from Kevin, from Jim, and some others. Here's some of the lists that I came up with, and this journey has been helpful to me so far. Number one, begin with complete honesty. Complete, unadulterated, unedited, no proper grammar, no dinner conversation language. I mean, like, the language you use when you're not watching your language kind of honesty. Complete honesty. In fact, here's four questions to help you be honest about the right stuff. Number one, what happened really? Denial doesn't help. Diminishing or dismissing what's real doesn't help. There's no path forward if we're not gonna face what's real. Now, I know that it's challenging. I know that it's uncomfortable, but it's there either way. We might as well be honest about it. Complete honesty, what really happened? Number two, who was involved, especially in hurting you? Doesn't mean you weren't part of it. Doesn't mean you were perfect. Doesn't mean you didn't hurt them. Doesn't mean you never hurt them. There's no qualifications in this part of the process. Just be completely honest. What hurt? Who did it? And then how did it feel really? This is the kind of stuff that we medicate around, that we avoid, that we try to escape and diminish. Don't do that. It's not helpful. And then number four, what kind of justice do you want? <laughs> Some devious laughter in the room. And that, no, for real. Now, I didn't need to tell you those four questions. You know why I know that people know this already? Because they answer these four questions on Facebook regularly when they're ticked off. (laughs) When you are ticked off, when you are hurt at someone, you know to answer this question. You will not believe what that person did to me. I will tell you all about it with a little extra, just a little special sauce on top so you know, and here is what they need. I know, I'm judged, I was hurt, I'm entitled, and they should get it. I'm just gonna let you breathe for a minute. It's real though, isn't it? Maybe I'm the only one, but I don't think so. We know these four questions, here's the problem. And we actually know the problem, but we keep doing. The problem is we take those same four questions all the wrong places. There is no help. There may be a moment of like vengeance relief when you post it on Facebook. There may be just a little bit of ice on that wound when you tell a friend, but you walk away with at least the same weight and you've given bitterness and anger another foothold. You've hardened it just a little bit. You've sealed it in and recited it one more time. The question is not, do we take it somewhere? The question is, where do we take it? And what does Jesus say? Do you remember Matthew 11? What does he say? He says, go to Facebook. 
He doesn't, does he? Come to me, come to me, come to me, come to me. He says, come to me. I'd love to tell you that with my list, I went to Jesus first. It's just not true. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm just saying if we're really honest, all the places we've taken it haven't worked. And Jesus can actually help. Maybe we need to go to some professional counselors. Maybe there are levels at which we need that. Maybe Celebrate Recovery would be crazy helpful to work a process through some deep hurts, habits, and hangups. We are gonna need not just Jesus. We will need spiritually wise, deeply rooted people who are able to be objective, lightning rods that will take your pain and your language and drive it right into the ground and help walk you into God's presence so that God can do with your anger and your hurt what only God can do with your anger and your hurt. People will be, we need our people, but we need the right people. We need helpful people who are not trying to be our savior or our solution, but instead trying to help us and support us, walk with us into God's presence so that Jesus can do what only Jesus can do. Who can point you and your pain in the direction of Jesus so he can bring healing? This is what we need. We don't need to power through. We don't need to cope. We don't need to avoid. We don't need to stuff it down because like we said, you can put it all the way at the bottom of the backpack as often as you want, but you are still carrying it and it's, exhausted. And Jesus says it doesn't have to be that way. So get completely honest, like Psalms level honest. I don't know if you've ever read the Psalms, but if you're not sure how honest you can be with God, read the Psalms. By Psalm 3, David, man after God's own heart, warrior poet, best king ever, famous, famous pit person in the history of the people of God says, bash him in the teeth, God. That's way beyond shin kicking. If you check out like Psalm 69, is it 69, 96? I forget which one it is. Whew, it goes another level. God has space for your emotion. He knows the language you try not to use already, okay? Don't be dishonoring to him, but be honest about where you're at, right? Complete honesty. Then, number two, you gotta pair it with something because if you just start there, it just stops there. But instead, number two, you gotta remember your story. Remember, your st- remember where we started this whole thing? What's our story? How did Jesus show up and take all that was before and begin to transform it? Because that will inspire us, remind us of what his capacity is going forward. In fact, followers of Jesus, one of the most dangerous things we can do is forget our story. Forget the rescue, forget the grace, forget the mercy that God has shown up with in our lives. It's like this guy that Jesus tells a story about in Matthew chapter 18. You probably remember this story. It's called the parable of the unforgiving servant. Uh, Jesus says, hey, listen, there was this guy who racked up an immense amount of debt, millions and millions and millions of dollars to a king. And the king finally calls him in and says, you owe me millions and millions of dollars and I expect you to pay and you and your family are going to, to jail until you're able to do that. And the man just begs for mercy. He says, please, I can never do, is there, it, please, just mercy. I don't even know what else to say, just mercy. And the king empathizes and says, you know what? Mercy, your debt is paid, it's canceled, you're forgiven, go free. But then the most dangerous thing happens, the man forgets immediately because he walks out and finds a man who owes him just a few thousand dollars. Legitimately owes him, actual wound, actual debt. But the, 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 he looks at the man and says, you owe me, you're gonna pay right now. The exact same thing happens. The man comes to him, the, the, the man who owed this man just a few thousand says, please, is there any way, I, I, I don't know how to do this, can you, is it mercy, please, mercy? And he says, no he forgot. What's our story, followers of Jesus? A story of debts paid by us or a story of mercy? He didn't say forgive when it feels good. He didn't say forgive when it's easy, forgive when it's tolerable. He said forgive as God through Christ Jesus forgave us. Listen, in our anger, I know, I get it. I stand with you. I, I wanna stand in judgment. And let me just tell you, I'm usually pretty sure that my judgment is right. <laughs> but when I get honest with myself and remember my story, I realize I actually have way more in common with the offender than a righteous judge. In fact, uh, I would invite you to check out Psalm 51 and Psalm 139. If we've forgotten our story, Psalm 51 and Psalm 139, 
The same man, man, David, who asked God to bash his enemies in the teeth in Psalm 51 recognizes his brokenness. When we forget our brokenness, we qualify ourselves as really great judges. And let's be honest, in our, in our clear moments, we actually know we're not that great of a judge. And in Psalm 139, the awareness, of the, listen, and Marjorie Thompson, if you read the book, will invite you in such a powerful way to each of these. But we need to remember our story. We need to stand before God as we are, right? Not just declaring that we need justice or that we hurt. There's space for that. That's where we start, but we also have to remember our story. God helped me in a couple ways do this. After I made my list of those who I just, I don't know a way forward with, I just, I can't quite figure it out. Um, I made my list and, and I've been having this habit, I told you about it in January, where uh, I'm trying to, different ways to make my body do, or make my body tell my heart what to do. So I'll kneel in prayer every morning, but I don't do it for long, one, because it hurts, and two, because I want coffee. But I'll kneel in prayer and here's what I do, I just say the Lord's Prayer every morning. Remember how it goes? Our Father, who's in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, not mine. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is, swear, in heaven. And give us today, enough, give us today our daily bread and forgive us trespasses if you're old school, that's cool. Trespasses or your sins, brokenness, as what? As we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us, God lead us, we'll follow you, lead us, teach us. Lead us, not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. One morning, uh, I didn't get past the first two words because <clears throat> God said, hey, 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 listen, listen. What's those first two words again? I was like, our father, our father, our father. Couldn't get past it. He says, who's our? Are those seven or eight people on your list? Are they us or are they them? I was like, come on, God. <laughs> <laughs> He's asking me, are you still standing across from them or are you willing to stand shoulder to shoulder? A few weeks later, I would be... Uh, praying through this same list, because Jesus says pray about it. I don't know what else to do, so I'm just trying to pray about it. It's trying to bring that, and sometimes it's a bash you in the teeth kind of prayer, and sometimes it's a God help me figure this out kind of prayer. And one day, uh, I started listing the offenses I felt from them, but instead of describing it specifically, I described it generally. And one of these people is like, wow, they assumed the worst. They never asked me directly. They asked everybody around who agreed with them and then they told other people untrue things as if they were true and I feel violated. It was a lie, it was unfair. I just wanna tell the truth. Why are they lying? Why are they gossiping? It's ridiculous. But as I wrote it in my journal, I was like, assumed the worst, didn't ask directly, told other people. And God said, hey Drew, have you ever done that? like, come on. <laughs> yeah. And suddenly I was the one who was not without sin and therefore could not throw the first stone. There's something in remembering our story where God right sizes. Bring the offense with all the fire. But remember your story with the same amount of honesty. And when we do those things, here's what happens. We find ourselves needing to ask for help. This is step three. Ask for help, ask for help. When we spend time with God in honesty and bring our hurt and brokenness and also bring our story, we realize we desperately need help to bridge the gap. What God has done for us is not what I want to do for someone else. And this is why we need his help. God never says do it on your own. He wants to do this with us. So we come to him. Come to me, come to me, come to me. Jesus says come to me. You'll only find rest with me. In fact, trying to forgive others on our own is like trying to fly with just our arms. It's not going to work. You will not get off the ground. You'll just get tired. We need his justice, not ours. We need his strength, not ours, to not give in to bitterness and anger, to not become hard-hearted, but instead stay tender-hearted. You see, too many people think that we, just, we need to do this in order to get back to Jesus, and we're somehow distant or separate from him until we do this, and that's not true. Jesus says, I will go with you. He says, what? Come to me, come to me, come to me, come to me. And so we should ask for help, ask for help. Right, this forgiveness is so, 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 so foundational. In fact, here's a helpful prayer that I got from my friend, Kevin Oder. After you've remembered your story, which is this, God, you gave me what I didn't deserve, right? Followers of Jesus, isn't that our story? God, you gave me what I didn't deserve. Help me give them what they don't deserve. It's strong, right? But hard. 
Uh, last step very quickly is this. Not only should we ask for help, but we should act in love in any way you can figure out how to do. I gotta be honest, on my list, I haven't gotten past prayer. Jesus said, love your enemy, which means sacrificially seek the good of someone else. Love your enemy. Pray for those who persecute you. Paul said it this way, we already read it. Instead, be kind to each other. Be tenderhearted. Listen, we just wanna be a people of short accounts, regularly releasing small hurts and addressing deeply and consistently with God the big hurts that are harder to set down because when we do this, when we show up with a lightness and a forgiveness, when we create space for others they don't deserve, we declare good news, the gospel that a world desperately needs around us. This is not just about us. This is not just about us traveling lightly. This is about people seeing Jesus clearly. And only when we live the story with them that Jesus has lived with us will they see how awesome he is. Now listen, I'm still working with my list, but I asked you earlier, who's on your list? Make a list. Make a list. It might not be as long as you think. And what are you gonna do with it in the next 47 hours to obey what Jesus has said? He doesn't say diminish, he doesn't say deny, he doesn't say dismiss, he doesn't say attack. Jesus says forgive. Are we gonna do what he, are we gonna let him teach us? You know, it occurs to me that I'm probably on some other people's lists. People make a list, my name's probably on it. I mean, we gotta be honest with that, but it doesn't mean that I don't have a list to address. I gotta start somewhere, and I gotta do the work. I gotta invite God to do the things in me that I could never do without him. That requires honesty. It requires memory of my story. It requires desperately needing his help, and it absolutely requires acting in love. Only then will we find the peaceful, healthy, spiritual relationships that Jesus entered this world for. In fact, you know what? I'm not just on other people's list. You know whose list I was on? I was on Jesus' list. You remember that? We were on Je- followers of Jesus, all of us at one point were on Jesus list who had offended, who had harmed, who had hurt, who had failed. We were on a list. Romans chapter five, when we were enemies of God. That's when he gave his life for us. Is there any greater act of love? You see, I was on Jesus list and to me and to you, this is what he says. I forgive you. Go and do likewise. We begin by getting honest. I would encourage you to begin now inviting God's help, remembering your story, celebrating that Jesus went first, shows us the way, and promises to help. Let's be a people who forgive. Sorrow 
God standing in your presence today. May we be so aware of the love that you have for us, the love you have lavished upon us through your son, Jesus. God, for a person that is here today listening to your word, God, I just pray that they hear this invitation, that this forgiveness is offered to each of us. Through your son, through his sacrifice, we have received grace and mercy when we didn't deserve it. God, thank you for your arms being open wide, waiting for us just to come close to you. God, I pray by your spirit. Today, will you just move in your power to let that person know that this love, your love is for them. God, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for the grace and mercy we have in you. May we be the people that go and bestow that on others, just offering forgiveness as you have done for us. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. It's not easy when we find ourselves offended or hurt by other people, but Jesus shows us the best way forward so we don't have to carry it all. He carries it with us and invites us to set it down in really healthy ways. It may take a while, may take effort, but he leads us through it. So I wanna encourage you, take some steps this week to invite God in to help you heal and be restored from all the hurts you've experienced. If there's any way that we can support you along the way, I wanna encourage you, send us a text. Send what's next to 94090. Some great folks from our church love to follow up with you soon. We'll see you soon.